Okay. Your your should be all set. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marvin Holmes. I am Dele um, Delegate Marvin Holmes. I am chair of the Housing and Rural Property Subcommittee. Uh, thank you all for being on time. You have all received the list of bills that we're going to be discussing. I do want to make a change to the order. However, uh, at the bottom of your list, you see HB 361, and just above that, you see HB 129. I want to reverse that order simply because of the uh, council that we have for HB 129 is Kristen. Uh, and Matt is the counsel for HB 361. So therefore, uh, we'll take Kristen for 129 very last. All right. With that, let's go to HB 105. HB 105 is a, a bill by uh, Delegate Henson. And on this bill, uh, she is uh, asking for compliance monitoring reporting. And I do not believe, Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong, there are no amendments to this bill. Is that correct, Matthew? That's correct. There are no amendments on the bill. All right. And what the bill is asking, ladies and gentlemen, is that, hang on a sec, I'm, I'm trying to do two things at once, admitting persons as I speak. Uh, what the bill is asking, ladies and gentlemen, is with the within the Department of Housing and Community Development, there is a uh, Community Development Administration which operates and runs the uh, Federal Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Uh, and the Federal Low Income Housing Tax Program uh, gives developers, uh, I should say gives, gives tax credits, uh, allows tax credits to developers for rental housing. And with the uh, Delegate Henson is asking for in HB 105 is that there be a monitoring reporting system for the monies that um, is being offered by the low income housing tax credits. Uh, and before I go to uh, Delegate Parrott uh, for his question, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Matthew to see if there's some additional items of discussion that he'd like to provide before we go to questions. Matthew. No, not at this time. Um, the testimony on the bill was unanimously favorable. Um, and that's, it's really the only addition I have. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Delegate Parrott, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just looking at the bill. It looks like it's about a $75,000 fiscal note. And I'm just not really sure why it's needed and who's going to read this each year. Well, it's uh, in, in the opinion, in the opinion of the sponsor, it is needed to be certain that we are complying with the how, with the housing uh, tax credit programs, with the housing tax credit programs. Uh, she's asking for the bill, asking for the bill, so that we can be certain that we are going along with uh, the information. For I'm sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once here. Going along with the information that the um, for the tax credits. If the tax credits are being offered for developers, then the sponsor of the bill wants to be certain or have some uh, some input into how the tax credits are being offered and who the benefit and if they are being beneficial as a poll, I mean beneficial as offered for the tax credits. That's what the bill does. All right. Any additional questions? Lower your hand for me, uh, Neil. Thank you. Any additional questions on I have a question. Third. So from, from exactly what Matt said, I'm looking at the testimony and I don't see any unfavorables. Um, nobody's reached out to me directly on this that I that I can recall. I don't see any any positions that are unfavorable on any of the committees. And it seems to me to be a good idea to have more information than less. And so that was I would move the bill. There is a motion. Okay. Is there a second? second? All in favor of HB 105 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposition? Um, any abstentions? 
I'm probably going to abstain at this one. All right. Um, HB 105 is an abstention by Neil Parrott. That is uh, abstention. All right. Uh, all, so uh, HB, all in favor signify saying aye. We already did aye. that. Aye. No, we did that. Opposed, no. All right. So HB 105 passes unamended as written by the sponsor. We'll now go to HB 313. And uh, outside of the fact that it has a sponsor amendment, it's a pretty good bill. <laughs> this, this bill, um, this bill, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen before. It is a reserve study bill. And the amendments that we all have that were provided to us, I'll read the amendment number just to make sure that we all have the correct amendments on it. Amendment number is 230014-1, which was sent to us via email by our counsel, Matthew Mickler, uh, yesterday, I believe. And what the amendments do in this that we have in front of us, the amendments put the bill into the posture that was passed out of the Montgomery County delegation. As I, as I explained to you last week, uh, last year, there were two bills. Hang on a second, let me admit uh, Delegate Silberti. There were two bills last year, one of them passed, which is Prince George's County, and now Montgomery County wants to be included uh, in these as well. And the, the amendments add the words updated <clears throat> to the bill. Uh, the reason why the, this word updated was added to the bill was because it, the initial reserve study is done um, at the very beginning. And then every five years thereafter, it needs to be very specific that there is an update. I see uh, Delegate, uh, uh, hang on a second, hang on a second, uh, Delegate Trossa. Uh, Matthew, you want to add anything to the discussion that, that I just had? Thank you. Matthew? Uh, uh, no, not at this time. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, actually, there was one amendment that was not um, identified here because uh, the sponsor did not request it. It was from the Maryland Builders Administration or Maryland Building Industry Administration, and that it was included in the testimony from that organization. Uh, pardon me, one second, your indulgence. And it essentially have the bill not apply to a homeowners association or a condominium, uh, a condominium that didn't have uh, substantial structural elements. Oh, right, that's correct. Uh, and uh, th thank you, thank you, Matthew. The reason why I did not accept that amendment was because when you start talking about structural elements, that is very specific. And there are some items in a common area that are not structure related, but that they are in a common area, which is going to be have to be replaced by the uh, common ownership community governing doctrine, which is why I did not accept those amendments. Uh, I've got two, two questions thus far, one from uh, Jen and then the second one is from Ann. Jen? Yeah, I just wanna clarify what's before us because I have two different amendments. You said where you have 230014, but what happened to 723822? I'm sorry, Matthew, but the- the uh, so if, if I may, um, the email that I sent out last night, that includes the revised amendments on any bill. So if you have older materials, we'll read it. The number of the amendment you should be referring to will be read out before. Uh, okay, before I, what I, I guess what I didn't understand was, it wasn't that I didn't see the 230014, it's that I didn't know that it replaced 723822. Yes, it does. So there's only one amendment. Yes. That is correct. Okay, that's all I wanted to clarify. Okay. Thank you. I like this. I like this bill. I'm sorry. I heard someone. I heard someone. No, I, I was just saying I like this bill and I think the amendment makes sense. I like you already. <laughs> Ann? I'll just double check. Is this just condo or is it also co ops? Uh, this was this condominium. Bill, 
condominiums, corporations, and HOAs. Uh, Matthew? Uh, no, I, I was just going to say this applies to <clears throat> all forms of COCs, so co-ops, condominiums, and HOAs. And co-ops. That is correct. Yes. Okay, it does include co-ops. That's what I wanted to make sure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would uh, uh, let my uh, let our subcommittee know that uh, Ann is questioning that because she has, I think, the largest cooperative in the entire state, uh, in, which is in Greenbelt, which um, uh, for uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was very instrumental in that cooperative in in uh, Greenbelt. Anyway. Just, just, that's your history lesson for the day. I'd like to uh, I'd like to move the amendments, please. Amendment number two three zero zero one four dash one. I make a motion. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I see a, a hand raised by uh, uh, Mr. Wyville. No, my question's not on the amendment. It's on the bill. All right. I see a hand raised by uh, Mr. Parrott. Mine's on the bill also. All right. Uh, so I have a I made a motion for the amendment. Is there a second? Second. All in, um, all in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the amendment on HB 313 passes uh, on the bill as amended. Do I have a motion? So oh, I have a motion. Uh, is there a second on the bill as amended? Second. All second. right, uh, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions? Uh, first is Delegate Wyville. Yes, um, I guess I have just a, a few issues with the with the bill. I, I do have familiar, familiarity with a small as association and their preference actually is to do repairs using special assessments. And I guess there's nothing in the law that prevents them from doing that. And I would have liked to have seen a, an, a, an exemption for a small association. So it's not in there. So I'll, I'll end up voting against the bill. Okay, and, and you are correct, uh, Delegate Weibel. If the smaller associations wish to have a special assessment, they can. This bill does not prohibit that. The reason why this bill is so, is so important on the issue of special assessments is because there are condominiums particularly where special assessments are being hit, the uh, unit owners are being hit with special assessments in the tune of tens of thousands of dollars in some cases, and those special assessments are required to be paid within a very short period of time. Having a reserve study would, would uh, circumvent that necessity, which is why this bill is before us. But I do appreciate your question, Delegate Wyville. Delegate Parrott? This has been law in Prince George's County. Um, how long has that been law there? One year. One year. And this year there was another bill to make it Montgomery County to add to that, right? That is correct. And my preference would be to go ahead and pass the Montgomery County bill and just see how it goes for a couple more years in Prince George's and Montgomery before we make it statewide. Any additional questions? All right, we have a motion and a, a motion and a second on HB 313. Uh, as amended, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? opposed? No. So that's um, Parrott and Wyville. Uh, any abstentions? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, HB 313 as amended passes. We'll now go to HB 352. And uh, unfortunately, just like the other bill, um, ladies and gentlemen, outside of the sponsor of this bill, it is a very good bill as well. Uh, do me a favor, if you would, uh, Delegate Wyville, and lower your hand so we all get, I don't get confused. You, you all know how, easy I, how easily I get confused. Uh, thank you, Delegate Wyville. Uh, HB 352 uh, is a bill. HB 352 is a bill that is speaking to annual meetings. And uh, what this bill requires is that, uh, one part of the bill requires that when a declarant or developer is in control of, of a common ownership community, that once that development reaches a capacity of 25% of lot owners or unit owners, then a representative 
from the community that has purchased into this uh, development should be appointed or, or be put onto the board. Uh, additionally, what this bill does, it this bill also speaks to the bonding requirements of the decorant. When a development is being constructed, there are bonds put in place. The other part of the amendment that we have before us uh, uh, indicates that there is a requirement that the uh, board of directors be notified of who holds the bonds so that the uh, bond, board of directors know how to get, board of directors know that there is a bond. We all recognize that the board of directors have no legal liability, no legal input in terms of uh, having the bonds held or any input into the bonds specifically. The purpose of the identification of the bondholder is so that the board of directors know that there is a bond. We've got two questions. Delegate Weibel is first, and then uh, uh, Delegate Tarasa is second. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, this only applies to those associations in a development phase, right? So if you have a condo association that's fully developed, there's still only the requirement for one meeting, one annual meeting? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Matthew, uh, hop in here. I think that there is a requirement. Uh, I think that this bill only requires one meeting. The, the, the bill does not speak to common ownership communities and their single annual meeting of, of common ownership communities in already existence. This bill uh, as amended requires two meetings a year. Yeah. A year. There, there if, is if, it is, if, if, it, if it isn't controlled by the decorant. Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong. Right, but mind. that's only those in, in, in the development phase, correct? That is correct, Doug. Mm -hmm. Matthew? No, there is a requirement that two annual meetings at which any matter before the condominium can be gotcha. discussed. So I, I am corrected. Yeah. So this, so this, this uh, goes across the board where two annual meetings are required for common ownership communities. Is that correct, Matthew? Yes, either stage, if, if it's under developer control gotcha. uh, or declarant control for a homeowner association or after the transition has occurred. Okay. So it also right, applies you, to HOAs. Yes, yes sir. The, there are nearly identical changes to law being made for common or for condominiums and HOAs. And the requirement yes. currently is just one meeting a year? One Correct. meeting at which, well, it's twofold. There's one meeting a year at which any matter, any business before the condominium or the HOA can be discussed uh, and, and allowing for unit or lot owner participation. The changes being made are now there'd be two meetings and during the developer controlled phase, there would be an additional requirement to have the two meetings uh, that the, the, that the developer have two meetings a year at which any matters could be discussed by the unit, the the unit owners or lot owners could participate. All right, so okay. Delegate Holmes, you had said that it didn't apply to existing HOAs and COCs. Is that the case or were you corrected on that? Uh, I was corrected on it, Matthew. It does apply to existing, is that correct, Matthew? Yes, that, it, that would apply. There would be a requirement to have the two. Okay, and then we had the request from MBIA about the clarification on the bonding requirements. Was that change made? That the uh, the bonding language that was included in the um, in the amendment, which is HB zero three five two slash eight zero zero nine one slash one. That this is amendments. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Four and five. And, and, th and this is this is their language, delegate liable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah. uh, I have I have uh, delegate Trossa, then I have delegate Silberti, uh, and then I have delegate Lehman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the only thing I had I I like this bill as well, um, and the amendment is fine with me, except that I'm I don't understand one. Part. This is on page five, line 17 through 19, I guess. And it is it from after the date 
that 25% of the currently subdivided units in the condominium that may be the development after all phases are complete to after the date that units representing 25% of the votes in the condominium have been convened by the developer. Can somebody explain the, what that change means? What is 25% of the votes in the condominium? I, I don't know what that change means and why. Matthew? Mm -hmm. So if, if there, if there, let, me, let me give an example. If there, if, if there is a, a development that is being constructed and 25% of the number of units have been purchased by the unit owners, that is the trigger of that, of those, that amendment or that language on uh, 16 through uh, 22. Uh, Matthew, you want to add something to that? No, that's, that's consistent with uh, my interpretation, my understanding of the language. Um, it would be 25% of the votes in the condominium uh, as designated under the, the declaration that establishes the condominium. Um, if oh. that, that was a point of contention amongst um, so, some of the, the groups that testified on this bill. Uh, there, I believe MBIA and I, I don't see, well, I, I, MBIA is present in the meeting um, and MBIA was part of that discussion and crafted this amendment, which was again, a consent piece amongst MBIA, CAI, uh, and also, actually, I do see members of the Attorney General's office here as well. Um, uh, Laura, did you want to add something in there? No, I was just going to add that we, we, we work with the Attorney General's office and CAI on this bill, and we all came to a consensus. So, and I know Karen's on if she wants to. Okay, but I understand that it's a consensus. I don't understand what it's changing, because what Delegate Holmes said sounded like what it originally said, and then what... Um, Mr. Mickler said um, was that what sounded like the change. So what is it, what is the difference between what it said before and what it says now? What it, what we decided was what it said before was a little unwieldy, but the point was to make it that when there was 25% of the votes based on language used later in the statute, we use the exact same language that that's when at 25%, that's when the um, change would occur. And then at later, and then at 50%, that's when they have to put a member, excuse me, that's when they have to switch over on a condo to control by the association. And it's 75% on a homeowners association. Yeah, and I, I, again, I appreciate that. And that's why, but I still don't understand what is 25% of currently subdivided units in the condominium that may be part of the development after all phases are complete. What's the difference between that and 25% of the votes in the condominium? A condominium may be divided into several different phases of uh, development. So let and, and if, if this is incorrect amongst uh, the, the parties that work this out, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But for, a, as an example, let's say you have four individual legally distinct condominiums or one development, 800 units total, or, or sorry, okay. no, let's, let me, let me walk that back. Say it's one development for, sets of buildings, 800 units total. Well, okay. once you develop one condominium, you might have 200 units and then fill 50 of those, but that wouldn't trigger the, ev the event here because that's all part of one, one condominium under one declaration, defining an 800 unit multi-building condominium, condominium structure. Now let's say in a different scenario, you have one party spinning off four individual developments, four legally distinct condominiums, and again, still 200 units per structure per building, 50 of one fill, that would trigger this event. 
trigger adding a member to the board. It's about, it's 25% of the total number of units. Is, is this earlier or later? I, I, Lori, Lori, were you trying to say something or you were muted? No, no, no. Okay, I'm uh, sorry. Karen, did you want to weigh in again? It's not really earlier or later. It's just trying to correct the language. So the intent all the way along was to be the same as what we are doing now, which is 25%. The language that we used before just was a little unwieldy. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's, it's saying that 25% of the total units that will be in that condominium to be, to be developed, much like 50%. Okay. I'm going to let it go, but like you're defining the new language by telling me the old language and I totally appreciate it. I'm just going to, I'll let it go. I want this bill to pass. And um, so I'm going to just, I'll leave and, it. And I think part of that is because <laughs> the new language in, is intended to clarify the intent of the old language. Okay. So, so, so uh, in, in, in other words, Jim, we put that in there specifically to confuse you. Oh, you did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. <laughs> <laughs> the next question goes to uh, Delegate Silberti, and then we're going to go to uh, Delegate Lehman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, basically, why are we involved in this? Why are we in the process of requiring two meetings? Can't they handle it on their own? They hand who uh, the they meaning the, the the board or they meaning the developers? Either one. We'll try uh, the first. Well, the reason why, let me ask your, your, your question directly, why we're getting involved in this. The reason why we're getting involved in this is because there are in some, some cases when the declarant is in charge and then later on the declarant turns the uh, control of the common ownership community over to the board of directors, there is no intellectual history by the unit owners or the lot owners. Therefore, we're putting a, a, a lot owner or a um, homeowner on the board with the, dec the declarant so that when it is turned over to the lot owners or the unit owners, there is some intellectual history in terms of what takes place. If we did not do this, once they reach 50% in a condominium, as uh, Ms. Uh, Strawn said, everything would be automatically dumped onto the lot, uh, the unit owners, and they would not be aware of what took place previously. They, they would get everything just dumped upon them. That's why, to answer your first question. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Next question goes to Delegate Lehman. Um, thank you. So Delegate Holmes, I'm trying to understand <clears throat> overall with this bill, is this, would you characterize it as being more about the <clears throat> the establishment of the, the date of, of the, when the council of unit owners is, becomes official and it's up and running and this two meetings per year requirement, or is it more about the, the issue of bonds or is it equally both? And, and how or why are bonds coming in? Are you talking about construction bonds or performance bonds? I don't understand the relevance of bonds to, or, or what you're actually trying to get at with the bill. Certainly, let me take the, the second question first. Why did I put bonds in this bill? The reason why I put bonds in this bill is because after a declarant turns over the community to the lot owners or unit owners, mm. then I think, and others agree with me thus far, that the, the board of directors should have some knowledge of what bonds are out there. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's an opportunity for them to have knowledge of what bonds are still in place. And again, the unit owners and the lot owners have no control over how to get those bonds released or because that is a, a con contractual arrangement between the declarant and the jurisdiction. But I do think it's important that the lot owners and the unit owners do have an understanding that there is a bond in place. And that's why the language was, part of the language was changed as recommended by the builders and others just to identify who has those bonds, not that the lot owners and unit owners could do anything about it, 
at least they have they have information or knowledge that there is a bond. That's all. Okay. Okay, and and you're you're talking about construction bonds. Uh, that is correct. Construction bond, yes, that's, that's basically primarily it, yes. And, okay. And and, and, and and as you know, th that's a, an agreement between the jurisdiction and the declarant. Okay. And and so are, is the bond issue totally separate from the two meetings per year? Yes, ma'am. I mean, they're not. There's not an intersection there for. That any is correct. There's not. Okay. Okay. And and so so overall, the bill is is equally trying to do both things to incorporate this you know sort of transparency around bonds with this establishment of this council of unit owners and when it officially is triggered in these two meetings per year. Is that? That is also correct. Okay, thank you. That helps a lot. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Delegate Weivel. Uh, 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 Delegate uh, Lehman, could you lower your hand for if you don't, man, don't mind? Delegate Lehman, thank you. Delegate Weivel, you're up. <laughs> you're muted. Well, you're muted. There you are. Delegate Weivel. Or maybe he doesn't have a question. Sorry, my computer jumped to another uh, screen. Um, I kind of share the same concern as Delegate Celebrity as far as the meeting requirement. I I was okay with the bill when we were talking about development phase because I think a lot of things really go on during that that the unit owners really should be involved with. But a two meeting requirement beyond that point, I I guess I'm not seeing the, the need for it. Okay. All right. I can speak to that. Uh, Delegate Trossa and then Delegate Parrott. Yeah, I mean, I was an HOA president and I also worked with HOAs for the past 12 years as a council member. And I got a lot of complaints that the board wouldn't, that boards wouldn't meet. And so there were no meetings, things would just happen and there were no way to know what was going on. And so they had to have public meetings when they met, but they just didn't meet. So I think this is actually a pretty important piece. I mean, some of the boards just meet and we don't need to be involved in that, but I don't think a two meeting minimum is a particularly high bar for um, any for any HOA. It just gives an opportunity for the people in the community to know, of the basically the members of the community to know what's happening. So, so if they didn't meet, they were already in violation of state law because the requirement was they had to have at least one meeting per year. Well, if they met uh, once, okay. But my point is that if you're not meeting more than once a year, then the whole year goes by before the community knows. So. All right. Th thank you, Trust. Delegate Trust, I pre meeting. Thank you, Delegate Trust. I appreciate that. Uh, Delegate Parrott. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess to the same point, I was on a three member board we shared equal responsibility for my HOA. And, um, you know, we meet once a year. You're lucky if you get a quorum, which we just don't get. And it, to have a meeting every six months, that would just be way over the top. It's hard for us to do once a year. Like they're pushing it like four, you know, 14 months. No one wants to have the meeting. Uh, this is a requirement that's just, again, it's over the top. I mean, especially for my community, this wouldn't work. So, so it sounds like, uh, in, in my discussion with the subcommittee members, the main topic of contention is the two meetings of existing board members. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I think it's important. So let, let's let's do this. Um, I, I'm going to take a vote on the amendments. Uh, we, right now, we're on the amendments, OK? Um, so let's take a vote on the amendments. Uh, I, we already have a, a motion and a second on the amendments, is that correct, if I recall correctly? So we have a motion and a second on the amendments. Um, let me do this, if you don't mind. Uh, on the amendment, uh, Dillaberti, are you in favor or against? No. Uh, DFH. Yes. Healy. Yes. Lehman. Yes. 
Parrot. Yeah, the amendments are fine. It's just the bill itself requiring too many more meetings. So yes on the amendments. All right, Jen. Yes, and I like the bill too. All right. Uh, Melissa is not here yet. I'm uh, here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so you're okay with the amendment? Well, I might just change my mind now, Mr. Chair. No. Ah! Yes. <laughs> You can do a thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, I, I, and, and because because I'm trying to, I am trying to host and admit people and all those kinds of things. I uh, I can't really see everyone. I'm so sorry. And uh, Bill, you in favor of the amendment? Yeah, I'm fine with the amendment, and I still like you, Delegate Holmes. Oh, you so special. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did Wyville just say he likes a bill? Yeah, he likes, he said likes he was okay right? with the amendment. He didn't okay. say he liked the bill. Okay. I was going to uh, say, we got we to capture that moment. <laughs> All right. We have a favorable on the amendment. Uh, do I have a, a, a motion on the bill as amendment? As amended? I'd like to add another amendment. So moved. So moved. So moved. Yeah, second on the. Uh, second. Second. There's a motion. Second. There's a motion and a second on the bill as amended. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor of the bill as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. That's Wyville and Parrott. And uh, Silberti. And Silberti. Wyville, Parrott, and Silberti. I've got it. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your discussion on that bill. Let us now move to HB. Uh, HB 451. <clears throat> HB 451 uh, is a bill that, is, that was presented by Delegate Henson. And this bill uh, presented to us by Delegate Henson is in reference to, is reference to uh, visual inspections. Uh, I want to first off take my hat off to Delegate Henson in terms of uh, I'm sorry, hang on a second. Okay. I want to take my hat off to uh, Delegate Henson uh, for her work in making sure that all of the input is put into amendments by the testimony that we heard. Uh, she's, done a, she's done a very good job in getting everyone's concerns added to the amendments. And speaking of amendments, if I could have you, Matthew, speak to the amendments that we have on HB 451, I'd appreciate it. And all of you were uh, giving a new, given a new set of amendments and they are numbered 470018 slash one. Uh, Matthew, can you talk about the amendments please? Sure, so the, the first amendment, amendment number one is uh, technical and makes changes to the purpose paragraph of the bill. Amendment number two uh, strikes references to remote video inspections and replaces that with remote visual inspections. And part of that, uh, the reason for that is just the, the uh, term remote video inspection is inconsistent with what's actually uh, appears to be required under the actual definition. Uh, what's required under the definition is just property uh, inspection of a property or element of a property using technology that allows the home inspector to visually assess. Uh, so that could be done potentially in a number of means and it, uh, the, it, it doesn't send it, it sends a conflicting message to say just video inspection when video is not necessarily required under the definition. Um, and, it, and the amendment would allow for a, techno, a technologically agnostic uh, application <laughs> of the bill. So long as whatever remote visual inspection is used uh, meets the conditions in subsection C of the bill on page 30. Amendment number three was an amendment that the sponsor supported from MMHA and AOBA that would require an on-site inspection to occur within a reasonable time after a remote visual inspection before a fine penalty or other enforcement action was issued against a property owner. Um, and amendment number four to the bill would authorize a local jurisdiction to uh, seek technical guidance or technical assistance from the department, uh, the Maryland Department of Labor with implementing the provisions of this section. 
So the Maryland Department of Labor is already responsible for the livability code, which applies to rental housing and already uh, is authorized to assist local jurisdictions that enforce the code with the implementation of the code. So this is really a, a reference to that. Um, was intended, and I believe there's representation from MML here who uh, suggested the amendment. Uh, they could provide more background on it, but it's meant in many ways to help those smaller jurisdictions that may not have the technical background to determine what is uh, uh, what is a remote visual inspection standard. Are the standards of this technology consistent with or, or uh, uh, calculated to achieve the same results as the in person on-site inspection um, and the like. Thank you, Matthew. And before I go to questions, uh, so far for questions, I get, I have uh, DFH, Wivo, and Healy, but before I go to questions, if I could ask for the Maryland Municipal League um, and the um, Multi-Housing Association to weigh in, I'd appreciate it. Sure, and thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Justin Fiore with the Maryland Municipal League. Uh, the two amendments we worked with were the visual amendment and then the technical guidance amendment. Um, the, the visual one, and this was in part from feedback from the committee when we originally opposed, uh, Greenbelt specifically asked that we have this amendment um, if the bill were to move forward because they currently do photo inspections for privacy reasons. Um, so they're not, they don't wanna go into the video world necessarily because it just opens up so many other parts of the house. Um, our code enforcement officers have their own affiliation and they said that's not totally uncommon, although most that are currently doing it are using video. <clears throat> so that's that amendment. The second one, I, I think the analyst described well, Matt described very well. Um, it's just in regard to when we adopt local provisions and ordinances for jurisdictions that don't have a code enforcement department per se, but would still have to adopt this and require a licensed professional to do it. Um, they might not have the expertise or uh, you know, they also don't have lawyers on staff. So their, uh, their law budget, if you will, starting from scratch on an ordinance is, is more challenging than working with a department that may have best practices and guidance they can already share with us. Thank you. Lori, I'm sorry. Um, any additional discussion from the stakeholders on the amendments? Mr. Chairman, it's Grayson Wiggins. With Grayson, the there you are, Grayson. Okay. Associate. How are you? Sure. Great, great. Um, yeah, I, we we support the bill with with the amendments. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we do, you know, Amendment Three is ours. We work with uh, Delegate Henson, the sponsor on the bill, and, and we support it. Thank you, thank you, Grayson. Uh, DFH. Yeah, I, th I think pretty much all of um, I think pretty much all of my questions were were answered. Thank you. Perfect, Anne. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I, my question is is about Amendment Three. So uh, I, I just wanted to uh, inquire. You know, now with because of COVID, people don't want you know people physically coming into their properties any more than absolutely necessary. And I wondered if that would create a problem with uh, the use of this uh, amendment to. Um, you know, stop enforcement if there's a problem in the property that people would actually have to let an inspector in and they have then they have to decide is the problem more dangerous to them than exposing themselves to a potential pandemic. So I wonder if uh, that was considered at all by the people who proposed this amendment. It, go, ahead, go ahead, Grayson. Okay, th thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, Delegate Healy. It was considered uh, you know, we, we spoke with, with Delegate Henson about the amendment. Uh, we certainly understand that piece and, and the concern there. Uh, from our perspective, what we really were trying to do with the amendment is allow this, you know, alternative method to be used with the understanding that the vast majority of inspections are going to be fine and they're not going to raise issues. And so this allows the county to, to really focus in on those trouble spots you know, when an, when an inspection does occur and a, a problem may be identified through video inspection and take the extra steps needed and, and utilize that extra time that they're provided uh, to really make it a safe uh, visit to, to the homeowner. Okay, the, the question would be, um, 
the language seems to require that there be an on-site inspection, regardless of whether like the, the uh, management would like to, you know, would like to just go ahead and fix it based on the visual and, and why would they have to wait uh, to fix the problem? So to be clear, they don't have to wait. The management does not have to wait to fix the problem. Uh, when we oh, okay. Yeah, they can, as soon as they're notified, hey, we saw, we had a video inspection, we saw there may be an issue, we're thinking about sending somebody out, they could tell management, and management could fix the issue before an on-site inspection is needed. Okay, that's fine. That's That was my question. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. uh, Delegate Trasa, I'm sorry, your hand is down. Great, okay. Yeah, that um, answered my question. Uh, great, great. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, lower your hand for me, Ann. Thank you very much. I just did. Thank you. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have an amendment in front of us. Uh, can I get a motion for the amendment? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposition for the amendment? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Can I get a motion on the bill as amended? So moved. So moved. Is there second. a second? Second. Second. All in favor of the bill as amended signify by saying aye. I have a quick question. Aye. Uh, sure. Uh, too late. I'm sorry. Too late. Too late. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Hey, with the amendment, the MML is okay with this bill. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm sorry. Let them speak. MML? Grayson? That's correct. I'm sorry. Justin? Okay. Yep. Justin? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so as the, the bill as amended, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, HB 451 passes. Let us now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on HB 90, we have a change on uh, our schedule. We're gonna hold HB 90 uh, for a later point in time, all right? So we're now gonna go to HB 248. HB 248, Delegate Shetty's bill, HB 248, is a bill that is discussing composting. And uh, the bill that is discussing composting at the present time uh, does not have any amendments. Am I correct, Matthew? You wanna speak to this bill on, on in terms there of amendments? Was, there was one recommended amendment. Um, it was, it's a very, it's a small amendment. It wasn't uh, any particular language. So if you refer to the CAI testimony on the bill, What's the bill number again? Just... I'm sorry. <laughs> HB, HB 248, 248, 248. Thank you. All right, thank you, welcome. Uh, and uh, what Matthew is discussing is that there was a suggested amendment by CAI. No action has been taken on that and, amendment. The... And that, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, I, I, go ahead, go, I, go ahead Matthew. No, I, I just was going to, Give a quick run at the amendment. The, the suggestion was that the bill be amended only to apply to single family detached homes and not to multifamily or townhomes. And there's a there's a concern about the composting in multifamily, uh, multifamily or condominiums or co-ops in terms of how that composting can be carried out safely and without additional concerns. Uh, additionally, uh, I have received some concerns about the bill overriding some of the governing documents uh, in the, uh, you know, requiring the composting. Uh, so I, uh, what, I, what I was hoping to do was <clears throat> maybe to get some additional suggestions from the subcommittee on uh, how to address some of these concerns. And I've got two hands thus far. First, we'll go to Delegate Lehman and then we'll go to Delegate Terrassa. Okay, so is it, is it possible that the one concern, I, I, is, it, is that, were you, I'm sorry, were you talking about, did you say common ownership communities or did you say co-ops, like um, what, are, what exists in Greenbelt? Is that a concern? Can someone clarify of Delegate Healy or where is this, that? No. This, this, this bill is only relevant to condominiums and homeowners, homeowners associations. It does not. That's, uh, it right, does that's not, what I thought. 
I just, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just said that's what I thought, but I, I guess I misheard what the concern was. But the concern is that comp composting can be done more effectively and without the concerns in terms of uh, other concerns, uh, more effectively in single family homes as opposed to condominiums. That's what the CAI uh, uh, suggested amendment was. So uh, I, I thought this was meant to apply to like container composting for someone that doesn't even have a yard. That was my, am I wrong about that? Is it not written in that way to talk about, you know, like somebody that only has access maybe to a, a balcony um, that, unless I misunderstood it, the, 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 as, go ahead, Matthew. So the the bill as drafted would apply to somebody who's actively uh, taking part in composting, um, or who may just have a, a container and collects organic materials for pickup by a third party. Uh, so it uses the, it engages the services of a third party composter. So it's not specific to what. You're talking about uh, Delegate Trossa and then DFH. Yeah, this just says they can't unreasonably impede that ability. I mean, I think this is a really important bill. Like, from my perspective, and I should say I live in a townhouse community. Um, my next door neighbor has composting. We have composting. Um, I mean, they can still put restrictions on so you can't just sort of compost in a pile in the middle of your room, in the room, your room, in the middle of your yard. Um, uh, wait, let, me, let, me, let me hold you on that point. I, I don't like to interrupt usually. But on that particular point, Delegate Tarasa, I'm not sure you're correct. And Matthew, correct me if I'm not reading this properly, but the way I read it is that if someone wanted to put a composting material like you're suggesting in the middle of a yard, they could based so, on his language. Matthew? So what one concern I guess I, I had in looking at the bill was that in subsection B, um, subsection B on page two and similarly on in uh, for homeowners associations on page three, it does not appear um, that there's any carve out for reasonable restrictions or, or a statement that uh, the bylaws or declaration could not or could not unreasonably restrict or prohibit. It just says restrict or prohibit. And, that, and that's the only reason. And that's the only so reason I interrupted C, process. So how does C? So maybe I'm not reading it right. How does C apply to B? So my reading of that is that. C would not allow for a condominium or a homeowners association to unreasonably impede the ability of a private entity to access common elements. So in a condo or a homeowners association, of course, the, so, the common elements yeah. are for the benefit of the unit or lot owners, not third parties that may come onto the premises. Uh, this would, I read C as not unreasonably impeding third parties from accessing common elements to pick up the materials. But I don't see that as saying that there can't be unre that there can't be reasonable limits placed on a unit owner or a lot owner specifically with regard to their composting activities. So maybe it needs to be in B as well. I mean, that, I mean that's the only thing I can imagine being needed. I mean, I think we need to, I, I, making it only single family detached. I think you can absolutely reasonably do composting in attached housing and we should be encouraging that. And we absolutely need the part where you can contract with a private entity right now. We don't have pickup in my neighborhood in a lot of Howard County, there's there, the county picks it up, but they don't in my neighborhood. But as long as there's a, the, you could say that you don't have a um, recorded coven that unreasonably restricts from composting, but um, well, I think that's probably going to take a couple of amendments, though. Which I would just think it needs unreasonably restricts. Like, yeah. well, one one point for the subcommittee's consideration, um, and I'm I'm just harking back to HB three twenty two that the subcommittee considered. Uh, when when you say 
may not unreasonably restrict, well, HB 322, which dealt with low impact landscaping, the subcommittee may remember, that bill defined what was inherently unreasonable. Um, so when you, when you just, when you tack on this unreasonably restrict language, it begs the question, do you then have to, do you then go into further listing illustrative examples or do you simply say you cannot unreasonably restrict and then leave that open to subsequent interpretation? I, in I, yeah. my humble opinion, I would put in line 21, not unreasonably, just as unreasonably restrict for the covenants. That's all I would add because I, I think to define composting right now would be difficult. And I think it progresses, it's progressing rapidly. And I think we would be back here soon to redefine every aspect of that, but I will. I, I think <laughs> also, <Now. laughs> I, I think also one thing to point out is that the bill, uh, when it talks about composting is specifically narrowed, I would say to just aerobic biological decomposition of organic material based on the definition. Um, I, I'm, I would wonder what impact, if any, this would have on say anaerobic uh, decomposition. So, or I've, I've done, I, I am by no means an expert on this. I've done a, a little bit of research just to be conversationally fluent, um, but I would say anaerobic processes would be having a, a paint bucket sealed airtight for, for your and I, I think that may be, may possibly be exempt or outside the scope of this bill. Let me ask a question also, Matthew. Right. Would this bill allow for a composting uh, apparatus to be put on common ownership properties, not owned by the lot owner or the unit owner? Uh, no, the, the, the provisions in the bill apply to, um, if, if and I'll, I'll just speak for condominiums because there's identical language for homeowner association. But if you look to page two, uh, line 23 and 24, composting organic waste materials for the unit owner's personal or household use, provided that the unit owner owns or has the right to exclusive use of the area where the composting is conducted. So but, uh, go ahead. I don't believe that. I have a that. question. <laughs> okay, I, 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 yeah, I, I, so, so, so the, just, just so that somebody knows, I've got, in terms of order, I've got uh, Terrassa, DFH, Healy, and Lehman. So I've, I've got you all listed. So anyway, go back, uh, Matthew. No, I just, uh, in conclusion, um, it would appear that unless, unless the unit owner or, or a lot owner were given Ex, the right of exclusive use to some common element, then no, that a, a restriction could be placed on simply saying there's a green space and I, as one unit owner, I'm going to go out and create a, a, a composting space. Okay, uh, DFH. So I guess part of my, um, I guess part of my question, I guess, to Matt and, and statement would be to follow along a little bit with what Delegate Terraza said. And, and that is, I think, from a global perspective, I mean, I, I personally do this at home. I've taught my kids to do this. It's really not that hard. At one point, everybody said we couldn't recycle. Now everybody recycles. At one point, we said you had to separate recycling from trash. Everybody figures this out, right? I'm, everybody figures it out and they can figure this out as well. And as far as, um, you know, townhomes or multi-dwelling facilities, I, I think it's, that's all possible too. And I, and I think we, we actually have to do this. I don't, I don't know that we have a choice. If, we, if anybody here on this call actually believes that climate change is real, we need to attack it in, from every perspective we possibly can. And this is just one of those perspectives. We need to lower our footprint. So that's where I am in the bill. As far as my question to Matt is concerned, as far as anaerobic or aerobic is concerned, I do think that you know, it seems to me like the, the spirit of the bill is really looking at organics, not necessarily paint buckets or any of that stuff. This is just what you scrape off of your, your plate. Um, so I, I guess my thought would be to make sure that it's clear in the bill that that's what we're referring to. Paint buckets, and that's like a whole other, whole other piece of, of, and I don't know that it does that or does it now? Uh, so uh, again, my, my point was just to what processes, what, 
what is meant by composting under this bill. And I would argue that it applies only to the controlled aerobic biological decomposition. So aerobic composting mean, uh, you cannot unreasonably, or you cannot restrict or prohibit effectively aerobic composting. Right. Uh, so now the, the question is, is it, as a, as a policy matter, do you, do you tack on anaerobic biological processes to, to make it, to, to cover all, all forms of, of composting? I, you know, that, that is the policy matter for you as a subcommittee to, to d discuss and, and recommend to the full committee. All right, but, but, but the way it's written issue. now, just so everybody's clear, the way it's written now, it doesn't include that. This is simply organics are pretty much off of your food plate. Off of your right. It yes, if if it does, composted it, by aerobic means. Aerobic. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that and that's in the bill, aerobic biological decomposition of organic so, waste material. And and the only reason just uh, Doug and Fraser Hardogger, I brought up the paint buckets was the to give a sense of how how people may compost anaerobically versus aerobically in a sealed vessel versus a, a, an unsealed or a vessel that allows air in to provide right. oxygen for the aerobic means. Thank you. And, and, and that's, that was one of the concerns that CAI brought up was, you know, an open container might have more uh, propensity for rodents and that kind of thing. That's why they brought that up. Um, uh, so uh, are you, you got everything answered DFH? Uh, I, I don't want to be like the, the skunk at the garden party, but I do have questions and I want to take a look at um, what would be reasonable to, to have restrictions along the lines of what CAI I was talking about, the um, odors, uh, if, if it's just not regulated at all, which apparently this language is so wide open that um, there are standards of how to do this. And if people just do it, I did, they just put all their garbage, their food garbage in a pile and you have, it attracts rodents or um, it smells bad. People want enjoyment of their property, especially if they're right next to each other. And like people do it responsibly, it's not a problem, but this bill sort of says you can't restrict it at all. And I'm wondering if that's too open, that it should be some kind of description of that they must follow some kind of state-of-the-art standards of how to do this so that they're not mm -hmm. problems for their neighbors. Yeah, the, and, and it is it is open, uh, but thanks, thanks, Delia Healy. Right next in lines of questioning, I have Lehman, Siliberti, and then Tarasa. Uh, Delegate Healy, I'm sorry, Delegate uh, Lehman um, is next. Yeah. So I, I thought that the idea is the main idea is to sort of proactively say, and I don't, I don't have the background or the history living in a common ownership community that Delegate Terraza and some others do, but, but I thought the point was to say that a common ownership community that doesn't already have some kind of limitations can't adopt restrictions that, you know, not getting into what is a good or bad or appropriate or inappropriate method of composting and the issues of odor and whatever else. It's just that, you, that, that it says that they can't adopt restrictions or prohibitions that would prevent the installation, that, that it's meant, to, you know, and it, if folks think that too, that's too broad, then, you know, I, I would disagree, but I think then that is, you know, a, a pretty substantial disagreement. I don't know how you get, get over that. Um, was some would argue, and I, I don't know if if, if somebody that, that lives in a common ownership community can address this. Is it is it very has it has it become um, you know as composting has really caught on and and become you know much more widespread? Do, do very many common ownership communities already have it, it in their covenants? Is it addressed? Is it not addressed? Um, it, it seems like this is. You know, it makes sense that somebody would bring this bill for it. I think it was only a matter of time. I believe uh, Delegate Shetty said this was brought to her by a constituent who was in a situation where, you know, he was either told he couldn't do this or he has reason to believe he can't. Well, uh, in terms of your question or your statement, 
relevant to uh, composting in governing documents. Uh, I'm not so sure that there are many, if any, uh, common ownership communities that have anything relevant to composting in their governing documents. And that is one of the arguments that some of the stakeholders are making. I saw Tommy raise his hand. And Tommy, did you want to say something? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, Delegate, for the question. I think what we're seeing is a move, and, and that's why I think our amendment is tailored the way it is to um, for the for the properties or the homeowners associations, whether there's space to do this and there's um, ability to do this, you're not seeing those restrictions come up. It's when the housing is closer on top of each other and people are trying to engage in this action is where uh, where we see the discord occur. Just because you're now, as Delegate Healy said, you're you know when you're composting, you tend to move it further away from your property, but it unfortunately it's starting to impede on someone else's property, and then they're there's this lack of harmony that then occurs. And so I think the reason we asked for the amendment the way we did was in the single family home space, there's, there's an actual ability to do this. There's an ample opportunity to do this. But when we get in the more confined structure of the homeowners or condominiums um, in those common ownership communities, we don't have that luxury. And unfortunately it does um, cause a little bit of discord between the homeowners themselves. And then they come to the board and the board then has to take action as to how they want to enforce the bylaws, whether it's a violation or not. So um, I, I think at this point, we're asking for the incremental step, um, you know, for the single family homes. And then if this is becoming more of a problem in, in a different type of common ownership structure, then maybe we can reevaluate that as technology improves. Okay, next question. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Next question goes to uh, Delegate Shilliberti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very quickly, I perhaps I misunderstood, but did I hear someone say there's no definition of uh, compost, or was I wrong? I I didn't say that. It, uh, Matthew, do you? I thought there? I heard that. If I don't, I don't want to belabor this. So there is a definition of composting in the bill. Um, at page page two, uh, line fifteen, and page three, line 11. Okay. Um, I, I think, and, and I believe that was Delegate Fraser Hidalgo who, who may have said about the idea of trying to narrow it down too much. I, I think maybe Delegate Fraser Hidalgo might want to respond as, as to what that comment might have meant. Um, but in terms of the bill, composting is defined. Okay, so I think that answers Delegate Silberti's question. Um, Delegate Terrassa is next, and then we have Delegate Lehman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I guess I just want to address a couple of things as, again, as a resident of a um, townhouse community. I mean, one of the issues that we have anyway in a townhouse community is trash. So the, a couple of things I would point out about trash. We already have the issue of trash. The things that go in your compost would otherwise go in trash and still be an issue. Um, and so I, I just want to Point out that it's the same items. We're not. We're not. Um, we're not talking about shipping items into compost necessarily. I mean, other than to help, you know, help with the aerobic um, digestion. But you're not talking about, you know, bringing in food and waste, food waste, etc. So you, it's already trash already smells. So you already have issues with that. Um, and so I think it's about being, you know, how you, you can. I, I just think that's already an issue. And, you know, to, um, to uh, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo's point, like this is just part of what we need to be doing as a planet right now. So I think that's important. Um, I think saying reasonable um, restrictions, I think allows for that to sort of play itself out. Like are those you know, not right up next to the fence or what does that, you know, what does that mean? I think will play itself out and, you know, we can certainly modify that over time. Um, I mean, right now, if they don't have restrictions, that's where it starts anyway. Um, and I would also point out that some single family houses are pretty close together and have those problems. And anyway. so I just, I, I would really urge us not to treat all of our townhouse communities and others differently. I think there's a lot of us that want to do our part in the, um, in the, in the, uh, for the planet 
in the urgency that it is. And um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I do want to mention that in some governing, governing documents, you mentioned trash. Uh, in some governing documents, there are requirements, for example, that you you can't bring your trash can't your trash cans can't be visible until 24 hours before um, before trash day or, uh, or something like that. So in governing documents, there are restrictions on uh, trash facilities or trash receptacles. And I don't think that there aren't the same kind of restrictions on 248, which is what some are saying. Right, no. but that might be a reasonable restriction. That doesn't prevent you from having trash. If it allows you to continue to have your trash, like if the restriction was you can't do anything with trash, you must keep all your trash indoors and never, you know, <laughs> like, that would be an unreasonable restriction. A reasonable restriction is you can't put it out in the corner, out at the, you know, the corner early you can't, um, you know, that kind of thing. You have to build like a little, sometimes you have to have like a little fenced area covering it. I mean, there's the same type of restrictions I can imagine being reasonable restrictions when it comes to composting. Okay, okay I, as, I agree. Hang on one second, uh, I'll get Healy and I'll, I'll get to you. Um, as chair of this subcommittee, uh, what I am going to do is uh, I, I'm, we are not going to vote on this bill today but I want to continue the discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to continue the discussion so that we can flush these things out uh, just in case there needs to be some amendments put on it. But I, I do want to have a full discussion on this for all points of view. I didn't mean to cut you off, uh, Ann, go ahead. Oh, that that's perfect. Uh, I'm, uh, we don't need to resolve this today, that's great. Yeah, uh, next I have uh, uh, Delegate Lehman. Delegate Weibel and then DFH, DFH again. Delegate Lehman. Yeah, I'm sorry, I lowered my hand. I did oh, not. I'm sorry. Uh, Delegate Weibel. Yeah, I hate to belabor this anymore, but in a question, when Delegate Terraza asked the question, is there anything in the bill that does require this to be compost? It's only generated on site. So what is to keep someone from having, you know, compost brought in and composted in their backyard. Is there anything in the bill that prevents that? What do you think, Matthew, in, ter in, uh, in terms of uh, the specific language? How do you address Delegate Wilde's bill in specific language of the bill, in the specific language of the bill? So I don't think that that, that specific issue, I wouldn't say is explicitly addressed. Um, that being said, I guess in part, it may depend on why somebody would be bringing in those materials if they were going to sell them and be in the business of, you know, they would have to be, it would have to be a licensed business. And then that might go to regulations on uh, operating a business out of your uh, regulations against operating a business from your unit or, or from your house. Um, if they were bringing in materials, say collecting from other neighbors and saying, oh, I, I'll take your organic materials and I'll, I compost, I'll compost some of my, property, I, I don't think it would restrict that. But to your specific question about bringing materials to the house, no, there is not explicit well, What if I work at a restaurant and I just want to bring all that compost in my backyard? Is there anything that prevent, prevents me from doing that? And I can see where in Delegate Taraz is questioning that may end up becoming a problem potentially as far as- And again, I, I don't think there's an explicit exemption for uh, against that. I think it might be exempted if they were trying to operate it as a business to resell the composted material. Well, I, I, and I don't, I don't want to be a, a curmudgeon on your question, Bill, but you could use the same argument. If I worked in a restaurant, uh, I bring exactly. trash home and put it in my regular trash can, you know, but, you know, but I, I do, I do appreciate your question, though, Bill. Yeah, but that's not going to uh, generate the odors with compost in your backyard. And I like this bill. Don't get me wrong. I just think there, it does potentially create some issues amongst neighbors. Yeah, I, I, I can, I appreciate that, Bill. DFH. Yeah. So the last thing I'll, I'll say because I think this is in, in say, say, say it again, uh, DFH. The I last said, thing. The last thing. The last thing on this bill. 
Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The, chair, I'm, the last I'm, thing I'm, on this I'm, bill. I'm, 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 I misunderstood you completely. Go ahead. Okay. The last thing on this bill that I'll say is like, look, I, I, I think that this is policy that we need to move toward and we may need to move toward it as quickly as possible in general. With that said, um, I, do, I do think that we should have further discussion about what it does to the bill to do you know, attached homes, that kind of thing. I'm, I think they should do it. I wanna be very clear. I think they should do it. I think everybody just needs to wake up and I would throw some other words in there. Um, but with that said, I think some of the questions should be asked is what does it look like for the whole bill if we don't, I mean, what, what's the, the concept as far as passage of the bill and having a lot of pushback on the bill if we include, you know, some of the um, attached homes? In other words, are we better off with this bill as a whole, getting this bill across the finish line? by pulling them out for this year and then coming back in a year with them in? I don't know, I wanna see this bill pass. I'd, I'd prefer to see it passed with everybody in it and everybody just needs to get over it. But if the prag that's the idealistic side of me, the pragmatic part of me is going, well, you know, let's get across what we can get across. And so that's why I think that maybe it's good to hold the bill and have a little bit deeper dive into the, the overall strategy of the bill passage. That's okay. all. Thank That's you, the last Thank thing you. that I had to say. I didn't, I didn't want to say anything else about this bill. I wanted to be clear when I started out, that was going to be the last thing I was going to say about the bill. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew that was the last thing I was going to say about the bill right now. I'm not going to say anything else about the bill right now. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 so when are you going to be quiet then, DFH? Right now. Good. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, any other discussion on HB 248, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, and, and I really appreciate the discussion. Uh, I want, and I want, because I wanted to use this time to really dive into it and uh, get some ideas on how we can proceed on this one. Okay. Uh, so uh, DFH, if you could lower your hand as well as uh, uh, Bill, lower your hand as well. As I indicated earlier, I'm too easily confused and. Hayes wa waving around uh, additionally confused me. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let us now, uh, the time is 12.20. Um, Matthew, remind me, our, our uh, committee meets at 1.30, is that correct? Yes, the hearings uh, for the day begin at 1.30. Um, okay. I did also receive uh, notice from Kristen that she's available, um, but of course, you may wish as a subcommittee to have some time between this and the afternoon's hearings. That's yes, I, I, I do. I, no. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jen. I was going to say my vote would be to finish so we don't have to come back later, but. Oh, we, 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 we're, we're still going to have to come back. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the, only thing I would say, the only thing I would say, since I said the last thing on the last piece of subject matter is that, um, is that we don't get to vote. You're the chairman, so you make the decision. <laughs> we, 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 have, uh, uh, we have a plethora of bills, uh, Jen, so we're going to come oh, back. You are, I, don't ha you, I don't have that list, okay. You, you are not rid of me yet, young lady. So, so are we uh, entertaining a motion? <laughs> stand by. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stand by. So we're, All right, so we're, we're going to meet after so we're going to meet after committee again today, right? This afternoon. Yeah, I, I think that's probably what we're going to have to do, ladies and gentlemen. It is now uh, rolling up on uh, twelve thirty. We're going to be meeting uh, in full committee at one thirty. So I, uh, if it's okay with the subcommittee, um, but I'm subcommittee chair, so it doesn't matter if it's okay or not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would like to pause now just to give us an opportunity to get ready for the full committee hearings at 1.30, and then we'll come back after full committee. All right, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. I, I, and, and again, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate uh, your participation this morning, and I uh, hope we can all be uh, as cordial and as attentive and, uh, as we are at the end after bill hearings. Thank you so very much. Do we we'll have a there. list for later? List of bills. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. So let's do this. In terms of after ENT bill hearings, we will com continue our uh, housing real property uh, hearing 
discussions on two bills and they will be HB 361 and HB 129, okay? Uh, Matthew is the counsel on 361 and Kristen is the counsel on 129. So we will have uh, those two bills after ENT full committee hearings, okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.